Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 4. We are in this series and on the Holy Spirit, and we've been talking about uh, the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We've been talking about uh, His person, who He is, His personality. Um, and, and there's so much there. Uh, if you've missed some of these, if you weren't able to be here for some reason, obviously we have all of the, the messages on our YouTube page, on our Facebook page. You can go back and watch the previous messages. But you know, we've talked about the Holy Spirit as a person. He's not an it. He's not a something. He's a someone. That's so important because you can't have a relationship with an it. You can only have a relationship with a person. And we need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so in that, we, as a person, we've discovered from the scriptures, straight from the Bible, he has a personality. He has a personality. He can be lied to. He can be grieved. Paul said, don't grieve the Spirit. And that, that's a very strong word, but it's, it, it's an emotional aspect. Because he's a person, he has emotions. God's a person, he has emotions. The Holy Spirit's a person, he has emotions. Jesus had emotions. We're going to look at that, uh, an example of that in, in a few moments here. And so as we were looking at all this and just discovering uh, who he is and how we can begin to develop or increase a personal relationship with him because when we increase our relationship with him, it increases his activity in our lives. He becomes more active in our lives. And we need the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? And so uh, here's another aspect here, though, of the Holy Spirit's working in us and how he works in us. And we see this in James chapter four in verse five. This is the primary verse we're gonna look at this morning. There's another passage in Mark 11 that we'll, that we'll go to toward the end uh, of, of the message. But primarily, we're gonna be looking at this verse right here, James chapter four, verse five. It says, or do you think, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. That's it. That's the verse. We're going to look at every aspect. There's three words that are really important in that verse. Dwells, yearns, and jealously. This, there's a lot in there that describes to us not only the personality of the Holy Spirit, guys, but also his activity in our lives. So does the scripture say in vain, James says, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us. So let's take a look at that first word, dwells. A couple of meanings attached to that first word. As you've heard me say over and over again, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. When you look at the original word in its original language, there are some nuances, there are some aspects to the definition of that word that gives us, uh, that gives us an additional understanding to exactly what the writer was thinking when he was writing this. But it also lets us know what the reader was seeing the picture that they were getting when they were reading this. And so this idea of dwells, that the Holy Spirit dwells. This same word is also used in Ephesians chapter three, verse 17, where it talks about the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And so there's a couple of meanings attached to this, uh, to, uh, to this word dwell. There's a couple of big ideas there attached to the word dwell as far as what it literally means, what the writer is actually saying, that the Spirit dwells in us. So remember... Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. If I don't go, he can't come. And when he comes, he will be with you and he will be in you, meaning he'll dwell in you. Now, once again, Jesus said, the reason why it's better that I go is because I've been with you. I've been around you. I've been among you, but I can't be in you. But when I leave, the Spirit will come and he's exactly like me. Jesus said, another helper. And remember, we said that word another means someone who's just like me. Same temperament, same personality, same divinity. Right, everybody? But instead of being around you and among you, he will be in you. And so the moment that you and I receive Christ as our savior, the moment that we surrender our lives to Christ, the moment that we invite Christ into our lives, we are also giving an invitation 
to the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So the Holy Spirit comes, he dwells in us. The Bible says he makes us a new creature. Uh, Jesus described it being born again of the Spirit and by the Spirit. So that's the work and the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He creates this new birth. The new birth is described as a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We look the same on the outside, but we're absolutely a different person on the inside. We were dead before, but now we're alive, right? We're, we're born of God now. Doesn't matter. I mean, we still have a physical mom and dad, but now we have a spiritual dad. Now we're connected to him. Amen. Does that make sense? And so now the Holy Spirit is in us. So what James is saying is he's describing what's happening now. The Holy Spirit is in you. He says, the Spirit dwells in you. So the idea behind that, first of all, is the idea of permanence. The Holy Spirit, when he comes to dwell in you and I, he comes to dwell permanently. That's literally what that word means. It means that he dwells permanently. In other words, it's not like when you and I check into a hotel room and we don't like it and we get another room or maybe even go to another hotel. I'm sure you've had that. Bonnie and I have had that experience. Check into the hotel room. It's like, okay, I think we're going to get mugged in the middle of the night. We got to get another room. We're going to check out. We checked in, but we didn't like what we saw. So we checked out, you know, it was temporary. It wasn't permanent. It's just like when you have friends or family members come to stay with you. It's temporary. Sometimes you need to remind them, hey, this is temporary. This is not permanent. Don't get too comfortable, right? Or we're going, we're staying with family and we realize, you know what? We were gonna be here a week, but it's been four days. I think it's time we go now. This is temporary. We need to get back home. It's a little weird. It's, I can't take this anymore. I gotta, y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me that spiritual like you've never had that happen. And I know you love your family. I'm sure they're fine. I'm just saying, there's this, there's this idea. So when you talk about this idea of dwelling though, and here's why I'm illustrating it this way. Because if you're, I'm sure you're like me. The Holy Spirit through our invitation, has come to dwell in us. Here's the good news. I'm sure that he has come to dwell, when he has come to dwell in us, like when we checked into that bad hotel, like when we stayed with, with family and friends and we really weren't liking where we were and we wanted to get out of there, we wanted to leave, we wanted to check, okay, I'm checking out. Ooh, sigh of relief. I'm sure there are times when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. I'm sure that there are instances, circumstances, situations, things about our life where the Holy Spirit says, I'm not really digging this. Here's the good news. What James is telling us is that no, even when we're ugly, even when we have failed, even when we've messed up, even when no one else wants to be around us, the Holy Spirit is committed to us. He's not checking out. He is dwelling in us permanently. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's permanent. He's not going to go, oh, I can't handle this anymore. What is it, like the sixth time you've sinned this week? I'm checking out. No, Jesus said he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. It is eternal. He is the eternal spirit and he has chosen to dwell in us and it's a permanent dwelling. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm telling you, there's a lot of times, all your friends, your family members don't even want to be around you. I guarantee you there's times where nobody's like, we just leave them alone. I I, I can't. The Holy Spirit says, I'm here. I'm staying. Why? I have a task. I have a mission. And that's the second part of the word dwell. It not only gives the meaning of permanence, thank God for that, because I'm sure we've all done things that should have chased the Holy Spirit away, but he's committed to us. But the second part of that is that is the second part of the definition of that word dwells, not only permanent, but it also is this, to be at home. So in other words, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, not only is he committed to be there permanently, but he's also, his desire is to make himself at home there. So that means once he's there, once we've invited him in, He's there to stay. 
You're not driving them away. But he also wants to move some things around because he wants to be at home. And I'm sure that there are times, there, I know there's aspects in all of our lives where he's sitting in his easy chair. He's got, you know, but he's looking around. He's like, you know, everything's great. But that couch over there is making my eye twitch. That chair, that old, ugly, damaged piece of furniture, you need, can you, will you allow me to get that out and bring in a new piece of furniture for you? That old, damaged piece of furniture that you think you need, that defines you in some way, that comforts you in some way, or is a monument to a betrayal or a monument to a hurt, that I need to remove that because I need to be at home here. Amen. Does that make sense? Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so he needs us to be willing to let him do that. Again, because remember, he's a gentleman. He's like a dove. He's not going to enforce himself. We invited him in and he says, I'm here to stay. And we're like, oh, that's good. Yeah, but I need to feel at home. And that, and that, and that, that didn't make me feel at home. Right? See, because really what we're saying to him is, you need to make yourself at home. You've heard me talk about this before. Make yourself at home. When we say that to people, we really don't mean that. Right? Make yourself at home. I said it. We're trying to tell them, hey, be at home. Be comfortable. We want you to be at ease. We want you to enjoy your time here. And the way we communicate that was we say, well, just make yourself at home. But we don't mean that. You don't mean that. And you know you don't. Because if you say that to me, make yourself at home. Okay, I think that couch ought to go over here. I don't like that end table at all. That thing's ugly. I saw another one over here, you know, that's a little bit nicer than that. And uh, let's just move. And that rug, let's move that over here and let's throw this one out. And you're like, wait a minute, what are you doing? You told me to make myself at home. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he wants to make himself at home. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? So here's what you and I need to expect. Don't be surprised when he starts pointing things out that don't make him feel at home. When he wants to start moving things around, replacing things, eliminating things, adding things. And I'm telling you guys, no matter how emotionally we attached we are to that stuff, man, it is for our good. He knows exactly what we need and he knows what's hurting us. Amen, everybody. And he knows what brings us healing. He knows what brings us healing. So he dwells. And then it says, does the scripture say in vain that the spirit who dwell, it says that the spirit who dwells in you yearns. Now we know what that word means. Yearns means longing, yearning, longing. It's, a, it's an intense uh, word. I mean, the, the meaning behind it is, is, is the idea that the Holy Spirit is longing for something. He's yearning for something. He's craving something, you know, to the point that nothing else will do but that. He's craving. He's yearning. He's longing. You know, it's just, it, it's, it, it's like, well, this is probably not even the best way to describe it, but you know, it, it, it's not like this, man, I, you know what? I'm, I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood for Italian. I'm in the mood for spaghetti and garlic bread. But then you're, you know, Bonnie says, well, how about sushi? Yeah. Okay. I'll go, I'll do sushi. I was like, either way, I'm kind of ambivalent about it, whatever. I'm just, you know, that's cool. That's not yearning. That's not longing. That's not craving, craving, craving. Don't moms who are expecting, don't they have cravings? Isn't that true? And it's like craving. I, what do you, I want I want I want ice cream. Well, how about popcorn? No, it's gotta be ice cream. It's gotta be ice cream. Nothing else will satisfy but ice cream. So it might be like an expectant mother grabbing her husband by the lapels. Get me ice cream. And a certain kind too. The right image, whatever the brand is. I need that. Okay. That's the Holy Spirit. James is saying he dwells in us. He's there permanently. He wants to be made at home. He wants to feel like this is his place. And he's yearning. He's longing. He's craving. Well, what in the world is it that he's craving? You. He wants all of you, not just a part of you. He wants all of you, not just some of you. 
And every time we hold a little back, he says, that's not enough. Well, what do you mean? You got two thirds. No, I need all of you. It'll be a lot better for you. Give me all of you. He yearns. And then it says, jealously. Jealously. Now, the word jealous or jealously in this verse is very interesting. The definition of this word is very, very interesting. Because the, the, uh, the primary definition of this word is not envy. That's, in, that's within the definition. But the primary definition of the word is, is ill will and or malice. Think about that. So the Holy Spirit dwells. He's permanently in us. He wants, to be, he wants to feel at home. He wants to make himself at home. He needs our permission to make himself at home. And he yearns, he longs, he craves what? He craves every, he wants all of us. And he does it jealously. Meaning, if there's anything that's vying for our attention that distracts us from him, his response is one of ill will and malice. Not towards us, but towards the thing that's pulling us away from him. The thing that's robbing us of our relationship with him. The thing that's taking something. Oh, does this make sense, everybody? That's why Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What's happened, what happens when we're grieving him? Well, we're giving something in our lives, the place in our lives that the Holy Spirit wants. Jealously. Envy, but ill will and malice. So it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the malice, the, 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 the emotion, because he's a person, right? It's the emotion that you would have uh, if, if a guy is, you know, making moves on your wife. You're going to have, you're not going to feel pastoral. You're not going to feel nurturing. You're going to, you know, he's going to be like, all right, I'm, all right, Sparky, about two more seconds here and we're going to have a problem. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not giving you a license to be do anything wrong, but I'm just, I'm talking about the feeling, the emotion, right? Does this make sense? Remember when Jesus was describing his crucifixion and his resurrection and Peter said, no, no, never, never. It's not gonna happen. I'm paraphrasing. Do you remember that? And Jesus' response to Peter was, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you realize he wasn't speaking to Peter? He wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was looking past Peter and he was looking at the enemy that was trying to attempt his flesh by not going to the cross and he didn't even play with it. He wasn't even gonna play. He said, get behind me, Satan. So the Holy Spirit, when you feel that intensity of him going after something that's taking, pulling us away, that intensity, that malice isn't towards you. It may feel like it, but he's looking past you to that spirit that's pulling you away from him, that spirit that's driving a wedge between you and the Holy Spirit, and he's jealous. So he's looking past you, and his intensity is not towards you, it's towards that thing. Basically saying, I'm not playing with you right now. You better back off. I, he belongs to me. He's mine. She's mine. Well, I want a little bit. No, you don't get any of it. She's mine. He's mine, right? Does that make sense? And, and so you're looking at, so when you see this idea of ill will and malice and there's this intensity, there's this anger, there's this righteous anger, there's, uh, there's a, well, well, there's this aggressiveness, right? Remember again, let me remind you, Jesus said, I'm going to send another helper, another, someone just like me in temperament and personality, right? And now we're looking at the spirit has this side of him where he's like a dove. You have to, he has to be invited. But once he's in, once he's, once he has sealed us, once he's marked us, once we belong to him, once we've been joined to him, if there's anything that comes after us, we at times can feel the intensity of his jealousy for us. Just like the intensity that we saw with Jesus. 
when he turned over the tables in the temple. See, in Mark chapter 11, it says in verse 15, so they came to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple, began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. So he, he <laughs> so there's a lot going on here. First, he's driving out those who are, who are, um, who are buying and selling in the temple. Then he's overturning the table of the money changers in the temple and the seats of those who sold doves. And then it, in the next verse, it says, then those who happened to come late to this whole drama that's happening, weren't quite sure what was going on, but they were also there to make an exchange and, 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 and take advantage of the situation. It says he wouldn't even allow them to carry their wares through the temple. And then he taught saying this, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. The people of Israel were under Roman rule there in Judea. And so the coins that they used, the currency of exchange, was Roman coins, not Jewish coins. Except when it came to the temple and the temple tax that they had to pay that was a part of their temple entrance and a part of their worship. What was happening is the money changers would change the Roman coins that the Jews had into shekels, into Jewish currency. But they would do that at a price. And it wasn't a normal price. They were price gouging. They were doing it excessively. And what happened was, is those who couldn't afford the fee to exchange the money to pay the temple tax would turn and leave and couldn't enter the temple and weren't able to worship God. Are you following this? The Holy Spirit dwells and he yearns for us. He wants all of us. And he yearns, with, he yearns for us with jealousy. Meaning, he's going to pursue or aggressively go after the temple thieves. What do I mean by that? The things like the money changers that are robbing you and I of our relationship with God. What are those thieves in your life? For some, it's anger. Others, it can be lust. It can be an addiction to alcohol or drugs. It could be pornography. It could be bitterness. It could be fear, fear. I think in this last year, 2020 and part of this year, we still really, uh, we're, we're justifying fear too much. We're not realizing that it's, it, it's asking, it's demanding an exchange and in doing it, it's robbing something from us in our relationship with God. It is a thief. See, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, a house of connection, a house of worship, a house of connecting with God. But you've made it a place where people are being kept from God. They're being, they're allowed, uh, things are being allowed to steal from them their relationship with God. And so Jesus said, I can't shut this down forever, but I can shut it down for a day. But I'm gonna make sure that it never has to be set up again in a, few, in, in, in a very short period of time. When I go to the cross and I shed my blood and I rise from the dead, there may still be thieves, but they don't have to be. He's already turned over the tables. He's already turned over the tables. He's already driven out the money lenders. So you don't have to let them back in. And I don't have to let them back in. He's already driven them out. And if we have let them back in, we have this beautiful friend who loves us, who will never check out, who's there permanently committed to us, and he'll make sure that he drives them out if we'll let him. He'll drive them out for it. Why? Because he's just like Jesus. But he's in, in us. He's in us. Let's all stand to our feet. Father, we just thank you that as we worship in this final moment, there's probably many of us that you're just pointing some things out. And we need to respond to you, Lord. And some of you may come and kneel to the front in this final song. You may go to the communion tables. That may be the place where that connection needs to happen. For you, it may need to happen here in the front. You may sit, you may kneel, you may stand. For some of you, that connection needs to happen through water baptism. But 
what I'm asking is that we'd be obedient to the Holy Spirit and let him start moving some things around and let him start throwing out some stuff that's damaged and old and ugly and doesn't need to be there. Let him overturn some tables. Let him drive out some the money lenders. Let him drive out the thieves. And so Lord, we're asking you to do that and we're submitting ourselves for you to do that right now in this moment let's worship him together and i'm just asking you to just respond in the way that he's asking you to respond let's worship him